Do you ever change your mind? You ever change course on something? I find I do it fairly frequently, and, and sometimes I even do it on purpose. Can you imagine that? Sometimes uh, my children will ask me for something, and I'll say, what for? And they'll say something to the effect of, uh, because I need it. And then I will say, no, you can't have it. And they'll say, why? And I'll say, because you won't tell me what it's for. I don't want to hear I need it. I want to hear what you need it for. And then if they'll tell me what they need it for, and it's not something bad, then I'll say, yes, I'll change my mind. Yes, you can have it. And we do this in a lot of other situations. Sometimes uh, I tell people, that I will send them something. They'll say, will you send me a copy of something? Or will you email me something? Or whatever the case may be. And I say, yes. Uh, but from so many times of having said I would do something and then not doing it, I have learned to say, if you'll remind me, I'll do it. Because I'm terrible about forgetting. And I don't intentionally change my mind or break my word but sometimes it happens because I forget, because I'm limited, because I am prone to mistakes. And most of us are like that. And sometimes even the things that we like and the things that we want change as we get older, as our uh, bodies change, as our experiences change change. The things we enjoy change. God never does. He never changes. And we need to understand that. Last week we began a three-part sermon series coming from these four verses at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 2. And what we're building up to, Lord willing, next week is we're going to talk about the greatness of of our salvation. And we're going to talk about what is so great about the salvation that we enjoy in Christ. But we can't really appreciate the greatness of the salvation that we enjoy if we don't look at the other details that are given around it here in Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 3 says, How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We're going to talk about what's so great about salvation, but last week we talked about verse 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. This week, I want us to talk about verse 2. I want us to talk about verse 2 where it says, For if the word of God given to angels, if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. And that's what leads into verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? One of the things that we must learn about our salvation which I could not put all three of these things into one sermon, and that's why I divided them into three. One of the things that we must learn about our salvation is that it depends on a word that never changes. God's word is unalterable. Unalterable means you cannot alter it. Alter means change. God's word cannot be changed by you. It cannot be changed by me. It cannot be changed by an eldership. It cannot be changed by a council. It cannot be changed by a synod. It cannot be changed by a pope. It is unalterable. And if you are not going to neglect your salvation, if you are going to pay much closer attention to your salvation, you have to get comfortable with the fact that it never changes. It never, ever changes. Now let's look at the details of what he's saying here. The beginning of verse 2, he says, 
if the word spoken through angels. This is a really interesting thing that's only taught about three different places in the New Testament. And here's one of them. That the Old Testament was delivered by angels. Now when you read the Old Testament, it doesn't really look that way most of the time. Because a lot of times when the Old Testament says that God did or that God appeared or that God said, well, God did or God appeared or God said by the agency of an angel. And so God did it, yes, but oftentimes what it doesn't tell you is that when God did it, He used an angel to do it. Well, the New Testament clarifies that. The New Testament even clarifies that when Moses was on Mount Sinai and he received the Ten Commandments, that he was actually receiving those Ten Commandments through an angel. And so then when the glory of the Lord passed by Moses, that's different. That was the divine nature. That was a manifestation on earth of God Himself. Different from the being from whom He got, the actual Ten Commandments. If you back up to Hebrews chapter 1, which we looked at this last week, but you see it there as well. Uh, Verse 1, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions, in many ways, in the Old Testament, God used a lot of different things to teach. He used really, um, um, really symbolic poetry. He used really symbolic prophecy. He used dreams. Jacob had a dream of angels ascending and descending a ladder. and God is sending him a message that way. God in the Old Testament used angels and different things, many portions and in many ways, divers manners as the King James called it, to deliver His Word. In the New Testament, He has spoken to us in His Son, the Word that became flesh and dwelt among men. And His Son then used the Holy Spirit, another part of the divine Godhead, to complete the revelation of His Word. So the Old Testament came through angels. The Old Testament came in different ways. The New Testament comes from God Himself. Not through the agency of an angel, but through the angel of Jesus, the Son of God, a member of the divine Godhead. And from the Holy Spirit, the third member of the divine Godhead. And so you see here a comparison, just like last week, of the source and the superiority of the New Testament. You see here the superiority of the salvation, of the grace that's given through the New Testament, delivered directly by the Son of God in human form and by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3.19 says, Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. Angels give it to Moses. Moses is the mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. That's Jesus. The Old Testament was only a placeholder until the new seed comes, until the seed promised to Abraham comes, which is Jesus. And so Jesus and the New Testament is intended all along in the Old Testament. God didn't change His mind. He's just building toward His ultimate goal. And you see, that's the key to understanding the unchangeable nature of the Word of God. God never changes. Therefore, the Word never changes. It's interesting, if you look, if you do a search in in the Bible for statements about the faithfulness of God, there are six different verses only one of which is a little bit different. Five of the verses either say exactly God is faithful or the Lord is faithful. And then one says, for He is faithful who? Six different times 
that statement is emphasized. One of them uh, is in, well, I didn't, I didn't write it down or I didn't put it where I thought I did. Uh, it's, in, it's in 1 Corinthians and it's also in, in several different places. But God is faithful six times. Never changes. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 is one of those places. That, that, I did write it down. I just didn't realize it. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and His loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love Him and keep His commandments but repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do them. The Old Testament warned people, if you do the word of God, if you love God and love him enough to follow his word, he will keep His promise. He is the God of faithfulness. He is the God who does what He says He will do, and He never changes. He'll do it. But if you mistreat God, if you say, uh, God, I don't love you enough to do what your word says, God calls that hating Him. And that's what He says there in Deuteronomy 7. Those who hate Him. He just means the people who aren't doing His word. He says, He will punish you. And that promise that I will reward those who love me and I will punish those who reject me, He always keeps them. He always keeps those promises. He kept them in the Old Testament. He keeps them in the New Testament. And His Word never changed. So you come back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. He says, For if the Word delivered through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. Now you look at that last phrase. Every transgression and every disobedience receives punishment. That is a reflection of God's justice, but it's also a reflection of God's faithfulness. It's a reflection that God keeps His promises. That God means what He says because what He says never changes. And you can't change it. And that's the point. We can think of several different examples. A lot of the Old Testament is dedicated, a lot of the history of the Old Testament and the prophecy of the Old Testament is dedicated to illustrating how God punishes disobedience. It starts in the first part of Genesis with Adam and Eve. What did Adam and Eve do? They ate from one tree. How long did they stay in the garden after they ate from the one tree that they were told not to eat? All they did was eat a piece of fruit. They lasted less than a day. Because every transgression and disobedient receives a just punishment. Because God's Word is unchangeable. You come forward to Leviticus, um, chapter 10. You have the sons of Aaron. Aaron has been made the priest. Moses is the lawgiver. Moses is the boss. He's the judge. He's the leader. Aaron is the priest. He's in charge of religion. He's in charge of the sacrifices. He's in charge of the tabernacle. He's in charge of the priesthood. Every priest through the history of Israel is supposed to be a descendant of Aaron. Not just a Levite, but a descendant of Aaron himself. Aaron has four sons. Two of them, Nadab and Abihu. And they're all, four, all four of them are charged with taking care of the sacrifices and presenting the sacrifices every single day to God. There are sacrifices commanded for every day and for certain days more than normal sacrifices. Well, two of his sons, Nadab and Abihu, says, we're going to take these incense pans, these fire pans, that have been dedicated, that we've been given instructions of, of when to use them and how to use them, and we're going to take 
And we're going to offer a different kind of worship. We're going to use these fire pans to, to worship God in a little bit different way. Leviticus 10, verse 1. Now, they, now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Why did they die before the Lord? Because they worshipped God in a way that He had not commanded. Why did it matter that they worshipped God in a way that He had not commanded? Because the Word of God is unalterable and every transgression and disobedience receives a just penalty. That's how it works. And for you to understand your salvation... You need to know that's how it works. You need to know that you can't change the Word of God. See, something very similar in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6, David has established his capital city in Jerusalem. He has won battle after battle. Things are pretty peaceful at this point, at least in the middle of the homeland. And David is a really, really religious king. David is a man who yearns for a relationship with God. He wants to be close to God. He wants to please God. And the worship of God is still in the tabernacle, and it still revolves around the Ark of the Covenant, and it, and it will long after David as far as the Ark of the Covenant. But David wants the tabernacle to come to Jerusalem so that he can be close to the center of worship. And so he sends men to bring the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant, when it's instructed in the books of the law by Moses, are given very specific instructions. Don't ever touch it. You take these poles and you roll these poles through these hooks and you carry it on your shoulders and that's how you move it. And only Levites can carry it. Well, David's men... So, well, it's kind of a long way from here to Jerusalem. It'd be a whole lot easier if we just set this thing down on this cart and let these animals pull this cart, these oxen. And so they're pulling the cart, and the Ark of the Covenant is sitting on the, sitting on the cart, and there are men standing around it to make sure nothing bad happens. And one of the oxen, one of the, uh, an ox stumbles, misplaces his foot, the cart jerks, the ark starts to shift, and a man reaches out to steady the ark. Don't let that thing fall. God killed him. Like that. Killed him. Why did God kill him? Because God gave instructions about how to move the ark, and they broke them. And God's word is unchangeable. And every transgression and every disobedience receives a just penalty. Do you see the importance of what Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2 says? It's not just a statement that's thrown out with no meaning. It carries example after example after example of the importance of God's Word and the unchangeableness of God's Word. And for you to understand what a glorious and beautiful salvation you enjoy, you better understand how important God's Word is to your salvation. And you see this all over the New Testament. John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus says to the apostles, He who rejects you, rejects me. He who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The word, I, and he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings, has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Jesus says, you will be judged based on His Word. And if you reject what He said, you're rejecting Him. If you reject His Word, you're rejecting Jesus. You see the importance of that, right? You see how God looks at what He said. And how God wants you to look 
at what he said. He wants you to look at it like the most important thing in, your, in the world because that's what it is. Um, and here is the biggest problem that we have in our little neck of the religious world today. And this problem has been going on for 1,900 years, maybe longer. It's been really, really bad for 1,500 years. Uh, it's gotten a little bit better in the last 200 years, but it's still really, really bad. And here's the problem. People believe that the Word of God is supposed to change. It's supposed to evolve. And so what Christian teachers taught today, teach today, should be different than what Christian teachers taught in the past. And the way the church functions today should be different than the way the church functioned in the past. And the way Christians relate to God and the way sinners receive salvation is different today than the way it was in the past. You know what the truth is, right? The Word of God is unalterable. It never changes. It's not supposed to change. And the way a person goes from being a sinner to a saint has never changed. The way the church is supposed to be organized has never changed. The way it's supposed to be led has never changed. The way it's supposed to worship has never changed. It doesn't change. It's always new. It's always fresh. God never changes. And His people don't change. in the way they relate to Him Maybe the clothes we wear changes. The rooms we sit in change. The songs we sing change. Because they're not in God's Word. They reflect God's Word, but they're not God's Word. But what God's Word says about what a person does to receive forgiveness, that is God's Word. What, the, what a congregation does to express praise and glory and thanksgiving, and to memorialize the death of Jesus, that is God's Word. And that never changes. It never changes. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Paul says, you have gone from the gospel that I taught to a different gospel. You've gone from the gospel that I brought to you to a different gospel. And what does he equate that to? Deserting Christ. Look at it again. Deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Verse 7, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached, he is to be accursed. Let me say again, even if we or an angel from heaven preaches to you any gospel other than what we preach to you, he is to be accursed. Do you hear the warning in that? Do you hear the warning that there are going to be people who say they have an inspiration from God? There are going to be people who say that God has told them or that an angel came and spoke to them and told them that it's actually supposed to be different than what Paul and the other apostles wrote. That's what he's saying. And what's your reaction supposed to be? They are accursed. They are damned. They are condemned. They are to be cast out because that is false. And that's not another gospel. It's a fake fraud gospel that will separate you from Christ. Do you see the danger, the risk of neglecting your salvation by thinking the Word of God changes? It's all over the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Paul says, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Devotion to Christ is simple. It's not difficult, it's not complicated, but it's pure. Verse 4, 
For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. You don't have any problem with it. You're okay with that. Oh, yeah, they're teaching a little bit different. Uh, it, you know, Jesus is a little bit different the way they talk about it. But well, that's fine. Come down to verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Servants of Satan disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. They look like good people. They look like people who love God and love God's Word. But what do they do? They change God's Word. They look like they're doing what God wants them to do, but they teach like God's Word has changed. God's Word doesn't change. Don't be fooled. Don't be confused. This is a difficult thing. But that's why Jesus and the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament warn us about it over and over and over. There are people who will lie to you about what the Bible says and what the Bible means. And you know whose responsibility it is to guard yourself from that? It's yours. It's yours. Elders are supposed to help you with it. Bible class teachers are supposed to help you with it. Teacher, preachers are supposed to help you with it. But you know, the only person you can actually trust is you. So don't neglect your salvation. Pay much closer attention. Because the Word of God doesn't change. It never, ever changes. So let me ask you this. What are you willing to endure? Because you and I know how this feels, right? We know how uncomfortable it is to be called names. And we know how uncomfortable it is for people to look at us as the problem. People to look at us, people look at us as hateful or evil. But let me tell you something. If you tell many of the people that you know that the Word of God never changes, you're going to be called names. You're going to be called names like bigot, like arrogant, like hateful, like legalist. And they're going to say a lot of other bad things about you. They're going to say things like, well, you think you're the only one who can understand the Bible. No, but sometimes it feels like we're the only ones trying to understand the Bible. You think you're the only ones going to heaven. I pray that that's not the case, but I tell you what, I'm not going to go to hell because you want me to change what I teach. I'm not deciding who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. I'm trying to pay closer attention to the great salvation that's been offered to me. And I'm not going to neglect it. I'm not going to ignore it. And I'm certainly not going to believe that the Word of God changed because you say it changed. I'm not going to do it. But it's uncomfortable. It's unpleasant for people to think that you're hateful and that you're dividing people. I wish that every person who was in any kind of group that called itself with a name like Christian would say, let's just go to the Bible. Let's just see what it says, and let's just do what it says, and let's get rid of everything else. I welcome it. I pray for it. I hope it happens. It has happened in the past. It's happening less today, but it happened some in the past. But if we stand up and say, uh, no, my salvation is too great, I'm not going to put my faith in anything that looks like a difference from the gospel. We can have an influence on people. We can get people to ask the right question, and the right question is, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? 
but we're going to have to pay a price. We're going to have some people dislike us. It may even draw lines in our own families. It may even make people who sit around the holiday table at Thanksgiving get mad at us. But you decide what you're willing to trade. Are you willing to give your soul for a little temporary peace and harmony on earth? And give those people souls too. Because if you don't influence them, probably nobody will. I'm not willing to make that trade. And I'll tell you why. Because the word delivered through angels proved unalterable. And every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. And how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The answer is clear, we won't. We won't escape. We'll receive an even greater penalty than what they received under the Old Testament. If you're not living in the Word of God, if you're not embracing the salvation of Jesus, we invite you to take advantage of the wonderful salvation that He provides. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, confessing, putting your faith in Him, confessing your faith, repenting of your sins, to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Or if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.